Let's see, let's get uh, started. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll continue from where uh, I left on Tuesday, uh, which is, uh, uh, if you remember, we are trying to estimate the uh, breakdown voltage of a PN diode, right? And uh, 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 the way we were picturing it is, is an, uh, uh, at a very large reverse bias, reverse bias voltage on a PN diode, uh, you know, P on this side and N on that side. Uh, the uh, if you remember the holes they want to bubble up, but the electrons want to slide down the bands. Uh, uh, those are the ways they can lower their energy. And uh, essentially, the uh, uh, you have a very large drop in energy here. Uh, essentially, it's close to uh, the applied voltage. If you apply 100 volts, uh, uh, if you apply 100 volts here, then uh, you know the band bending is 100 volts. And so the electrons are gaining energy. They gain enough kinetic energy uh, be before they can scatter, and uh, if the energy they gain is larger than the band gap, then there's a finite chance that the electron can kick out an electron. You know, the electron in the conduction band can kick out one from the, you know, filled valence band states, and then then you form a hole and an electron, and they multiply this way, right? So that's what we discussed towards the end of the last class. Any questions on that? Because uh, uh, the the way we uh, uh, essentially, uh, you know, when when this is said and done, uh, we we are looking at the maximum electric field in a PN junction, and uh, uh, the maximum field uh, has a uh, uh, you know a, a relationship with the doping and the band gap and the built-in voltage, etc. Uh, so uh, we were able to find a breakdown. You know, this is again um, within. Uh, Quite a few approximations, uh, reasonably accurate, and, and what is showing now is a plot of the breakdown voltage of a PN junction as a function of the doping densities, assuming the doping densities are the same on both sides, acceptor and the donor doping densities. And uh, uh, so, so again, uh, this is basically uh, uh, higher is the doping, lower is the breakdown voltage because you're already starting with a very large field, right? Uh, as you increase the field, the uh, as you increase the doping, the field gets larger at, in, inside the uh, uh, inside the PN. Uh, so we had a charge distribution that looked like that, right? Where we had positive and negative, and and the field looked uh, uh, like that, right? Uh, so if your doping is heavier, then you know this grows bigger, this grows bigger, and. Uh, 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 the, the the field slope gets bigger. You know, it goes like that. So you're starting with a zero. So this is the zero bias condition. And now what you're doing is kind of applying very large reverse bias and stretching out the depletion, right? And this is the threshold. Okay. Any questions? There, there could be many questions because I, you know, there, there are a lot of assumptions here and and, and, and that sort of thing. So so this is an avalanche process or a carrier multiplication process, and typically. Uh, uh, it, it typically could be destructive, meaning you know if, if there's no current limit, it will keep growing and it will essentially damage. The, what you're doing is remember, uh, essentially, uh, you know, every process where you kick out an electron, you have broken a bond, right? And and if the number of electrons you kick out of the valence band becomes of the order of 10 to the power 20, 21 per centimeter cube, right? Then you are basically it's you're breaking all the bonds of the crystal now. It's kind of melting or evaporate or whatever, right? So that's the process you know, to think about. And uh, by that time, the current density also, if you calculate, is large enough to cause other sort of thermal and uh, mechanical breakdown and, and that sort of thing. Yeah? How do you think about the opposite process? Like, can a, can a hole kick a hole out of the conduction band? Like, like does, does avalanche work for electrons and holes? Right. So, uh, um, I mean, it, it's uh, definitely simpler to think of all of it as, as in terms of electrons because uh, uh, the holes are indeed missing electron states in the in in the bond, right? So, uh, what what you are asking probably is as a hole moves up, right? Uh, it, you know, if a hole moves up here, uh, does it also impact? Uh, because, okay, let's see. So the hole uh, is not going to move up like that. It's going to also move like this right? at the same energy, right? Uh, drift uh, in response to the high field. Uh, and then uh, 
uh, then essentially, uh, but these are all failed states, right? So it's essentially going uh, there, and, and, and therefore, it, 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 the electrons are relaxing down anyway, right? So it's the whole, whole electron distribution is relaxing down. Uh, with the, um, there is a whole impact ionization uh, coefficient as well. So uh, both electrons and holes can impact ionize, both of them. So, yeah. Uh, I'm not getting into too much detail at this point, uh, but uh, there are, uh, this is typically uh, in, in most of the very high voltage devices today, uh, which are uh, aiming to switch hundreds of volts or thousands of volts. In fact, already there are uh, diodes that can switch 15 to 20 kilovolts, uh, a, a, a semiconductor diode. Uh, these used to be mechanical switches earlier, you know, where you have basically two metal lines that will touch or, you know, uh, these used to be mechanical relays before, but uh, wide band gap semiconductors are starting to replace them, you know, and so, so in, in the high voltage regime. So, uh, okay, that's, uh, that's one breakdown process. Okay, so, yeah. Uh, yeah, so gallium nitride, there's silicon carbide, so th these are three point some electron volt band gap materials now. And so what he's saying is if you can dope gallium nitride to a level of 10 to the power 16 per centimeter cube, then you should be able to switch about 10,000 volts or so. And it's getting there now. It's getting there. I mean, already I think there are uh, demonstration of 3,000 volt switches with this, uh, with this material now. So, yeah. um, but uh, remember, there are other, ba other semiconductors like gallium oxide, which is even larger band gap, and aluminum nitride, which is even larger. So it's going to be very exciting to see, you know, how, how far one can kind of push this thing you know, in the future. So the major challenge as you go to wide band gaps is obviously, you know, um, when we say doping concentration, this really means how many electrons and holes you have in the bands, mobile electrons and holes. In wide band gap semiconductors, what happens really is you dope it, and you can successfully <coughs> substitute, say, gallium with silicon or aluminum nitride, aluminum with silicon. But not every dopant really gives you an electron because the activation energy is very high. You know, these are very wide band gaps. So you, for every, for example, in gallium nitride for p-type doping, if you put in 10 to the power 18 dopants, you get only 10 to the power 16 holes. You know? so, so, so essentially, that that is a, a kind of interesting situation, which kind of means you can even get higher dope, higher breakdown with this stuff. It's just that. Anyway, there are, there are many angles to this story, but uh, doping concentration goes as one over doping and gap goes as square, but the gap is also not quite uh, unrelated. I mean, the gap is related to the effective mass too, so, so they are somewhat related uh, as well. Uh, so, but this is a rough estimate. Okay, okay so I'm, uh, remember this is the reverse bias condition, and please, uh, again, read the chapter three, which is the review of devices from, from the book. Uh, uh, there are other processes by which breakdown occurs. Uh, uh, there is obviously interband tunneling, uh, which is Zener tunneling, and uh, uh, and then there is uh, also trap-assisted tunneling, where where you have uh, you know defects in the semiconductor, and the electron will go through that from the from the uh, valence band into the conduction band. Um, this part we will probably discuss at some point later. Uh, uh, typically, if you take a PN diode and its break, its its breakdown is typically because of uh, avalanche. Uh, uh, but then you can redesign it uh, with a proper doping. Especially if you go to very high doping levels, you can let tunneling dominate rather than avalanche. You know? So so you can kind of play the games there. Uh, okay. So what I want to do next is uh, uh, again um, complete this discussion uh, and and the. Uh, uh, primarily, I want to just finish up the discussion uh, of the uh, other bias, which is the forward bias of the diode. Right? So just like in reverse bias, our depletion region expands. In forward bias, it's going to shrink. Right? Uh, this makes sense because on the P side, uh, I'm going to apply positive voltage now uh, when I apply forward bias to the PN diode. And on the N side, it's grounded, let's say. And so I want the P side to become more positive, and the way to do that is it will become less negative, you know, it's a shrink, right? And, 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 and in terms of depletion region and fields, so this will shrink, you know, from here to there, shrink from here to there, and the field will go like that, right? Uh, you know, it's because field just rigidly moves because the doping is fixed, so it starts moving in like that. Therefore, this area is whatever voltage you have applied. Right? 
the area under the field is always the voltage applied, right? Uh, or rather, area under the field is the total voltage drop across the junction. And uh, at zero bias, you have the built-in voltage, right? And then anything changing from there is the applied voltage. So, so this is the differential is always the... Uh, so so uh, you can see it shrinks. And your energy band diagram, as a result, the maximum or the peak field has gone down. And the energy band diagram uh, now has uh, what you uh, kind of refer as, uh, as, 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 as the Fermi or the quasi-Fermi levels. Uh, let me just sketch this out, the band diagram, and I, I want to do this now because we are uh, in about 10, 15 minutes, we'll be talking about heterojunctions, and then, you know, whatever I'm drawing here is not, not this straightforward. It, it is straightforward too, but it's not as straightforward once you go to the heterojunction because there are, you know, uh, two or three layers of uh, more interesting things that come in right away in a compound semiconductor. Heterojunction, PN diode. Okay. But here it's, it's a, uh, what you've done is, you know, uh, you, you have applied a positive voltage on the uh, P side. Uh, and so, so if I were to sketch the Fermi levels, originally the Fermi level was same, or the chemical potential was the same everywhere, right? But no, no more, because uh, what has happened is, you know, this side or the N side of your semiconductor uh, and is in equilibrium with the ground, which is at zero volts, let's say, right? But the P side of you know the holes and all that are in equilibrium with this battery, which has applied uh, of a, a certain voltage. Right? So their equilibrium Fermi levels are now different; they have split. This is non-equilibrium situation, uh, and uh, uh, the right side, or if you want to call it now, the Fermi level on the N side, the Fermi level on the P side. We can call them like that. This is called the quasi Fermi level, or you know uh, the. Uh, yeah, let's call it. It's a quasi-Fermi level. C clearly, uh, uh, under non-equilibrium situations, you have uh, uh, the reason we are going to model it this way is because uh, uh, we'll, we'll see that far away from the junction, you know, nothing much has changed. Uh, uh, far away from the junction, so here's the depletion region. It has shrunk, and uh, outside the depletion region, the the band, you know, the bands look somewhat similar to before. Here's my EC on the N side, EV on the N side, valence band, fill states, EV on the P side, and EC on the P side. Yeah. And sorry, these are fill states. Uh, I think I, I've drawn a heterostructure already. That's not good, right? So, uh, uh, OK. Fn, Fp. OK, this looks like a different band gap than this structure, right? So let's fix that. <laughs> and what did I do here, actually? Oh, yeah, I have applied more voltage than the gap. That's not good either. OK, so you see, I already, I mean, it's not letting me do that because I'm making some assumptions which are not quite right. So let's do it more correctly. Okay. Fn. So uh, j just to you know, uh, be clear, before you applied the voltage, Fermi level was uniform. And your band diagram, let's just sketch it like that. It looks something like that, right? Here's the band diagram before you applied the voltage. Now we are basically you know, saying this is fixed. And I've lowered this a little bit. And that's what I'm trying to sketch. Okay, so, uh, and I've lowered the barrier for current flow across the junction. So. Oh, sorry. FP. L let me sketch this whole thing out. So the Fermi level on the P side, I'm just going to sketch it like that. And Fermi level on the N side, which is here. But now this is fixed. I've just pulled this down a little bit. Okay. So I'll just sketch that here. Fermi level on the N side. And uh, OK, let's draw a bigger back. That's fine. Now we can do it correctly. A Fermi level on N side far away is kind of closer to the band gap here. And now still looks a little different, but I, oh, that's fine. Okay. Uh, so uh, we're looking at a homo junction, but the Fermi levels are now separated. And, and, and then uh, what, the way I'm sketching it, uh, uh, is is that uh, far from the junction inside the neutral region of the p type and inside the neutral region of the n side nothing really has changed so this 
is EC on the N side minus Fermi level on the N side is still given by the doping density. That controls it. Doping density here, far away from here, that also controls it. Uh, those relations are KT, natural log of uh, doping uh, density over NC on the N side. We, we did that in the last class, I know. It was just the relationship between the doping and the Fermi level, where it is. Even though it's quasi-Fermi level, we're saying very far from it, it's still in equilibrium. Uh, nothing much has changed. And, and similarly, uh, is this, uh, j just we can check this, if ND is high, then Fermi level should be, uh, let's, let me, let me maybe uh, make sure that this is correct, ND, yeah, so this is not correct. Uh, this is the correct relation. Uh, this is EC, and so on on the P side. I'm not going to kind of write this all detail out, but uh, uh, the, the the net result is is you have kind of you know here the barrier height was VBI for electrons to go across. Now it's uh, VBI minus the applied voltage, right? And then for both electrons and for holes. So initially. Uh, I should have probably sketched them right on top of each other, but initially it was v VBI, now it has become VBI minus the applied voltage. The barrier has become smaller because I think you can see we've raised this a little bit. Okay. So it's a little easier for electrons and holes to go across. How much easier? Exponentially, because this thing is exponential decay, right? Uh, the, the, uh, and and uh, the electron density is dying exponentially, so as you raise this, an exponentially large number of electrons can now make it because the tail moved up. Similarly, this exponential large number of holes can make it. What is very important uh, in a normal homojunction semiconductor, uh, characteristic of a homojunction semiconductor uh, under you know, ordinary conditions, is the barrier for the electrons and the holes is exactly the same. For electrons and holes is exactly the same. And this you can completely change the game in a heterostructure. So, so this is a v one of the most important properties of the compound semiconductor heterostructure is the barrier for electrons and holes can be very different. You know. and, and that difference is the key to most heterostructure applications. This is the most important uh, you know, uh, sort of uh, that asymmetry is, 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 is directly leads to gain and, and, uh, uh, and uh, all kinds of other things. Okay, so, so, okay, so uh, I could spend more time trying to get, uh, derive this, but I, I want to kind of move on and assume that you have seen this uh, you know, PN diode currently. What I'll do, though, is just write down the expression for the forward current. And the expression for the forward current comes from the picture that you know, when you are, when you are uh, applying a forward bias voltage, you have a lot more electrons on the, left, on the right side, but very little on the left side. And uh, if I were to plot the minority carriers you know, on the left side, this is my N on the P side. Okay? That's the minority carriers. I'm plotting maybe a log scale of that. Okay? Or let's plot linear scale. Okay, so it's something, and, and I think you know that that is equal to NI on the P side squared over the doping density of acceptors on the P side. We did that. In this. this is you know from the mass action law. N on the P side times P on the P side, which is equal to the acceptor doping density, is equal to NI squared. But I'm labeling it now because I'm going to now move into heterostructures for which Ni, which is the intrinsic carrier concentration, will not be the same on the N and P sides. So, so that's the key difference of a heterostructure. It's the most important point, really. Yeah. Everything is a consequence of that. Okay. Similarly, uh, you know, let's say you have a P, which is slightly different here, P on the N side, which is Ni on the N side square over N. Doping density, uh, donor doping density on the inside, and then you have your majority carrier density as well, which is much higher. You know, remember this is of the order of 10 to the power three or 10 to the power four, and this is 10 to the power 18 or 19. Right? So it's much higher. And uh, uh, again, uh, I, th I think that thing also about this uh, uh, device is the majority carriers really don't play a big role in, in the PN diode. It's the minority carrier that dominates most. You already saw why in reverse bias, right? In reverse bias, we discussed that in the last time. The minority carriers are the one that, you know, has see uh, the right, you know, direction in potential, right? The, uh, you know, when you apply very large reverse bias, the, you know, on, on the P side, the holes 
uh, which are the majority carriers, have to go, you know, uh, go, go down here, and holes don't want to go down. They want to go up. Uh, similarly, the electrons, which are the majority carrier on the inside, to ca conduct the current, they must go up, but the barrier is too high. So what happens is, you know, uh, the holes from here, which is p side, which which is the majority, uh, which is the minority carrier, sees a much easier path. So that d controls controls the current. Similarly, in forward bias too, uh, that's what's going to happen. So when you apply a forward bias, uh, uh, essentially what you have, you're doing is uh, you have uh, a lot of electrons here, which is n on the n side, roughly equal to the doping density, and p on the p side, roughly equal to the accepted doping density. Uh, and under forward bias, what you're doing, you can also track it directly with signs. You know, when you apply a positive voltage here, you can think of it very simply that you have a p-type semiconductor, you want to get rid of holes, right? So you're going to inject holes into the n side. That's what's going Similarly, you know, uh, uh, it's going to inject electrons from this side, uh, and uh, so there's a lot of electron injection this way, and a lot of hole injection that way. Right? So that, that that's what's going to happen when you apply a forward bias, and uh, you can see that this is exactly opposite of what happens under reverse bias, where electrons go this way and the holes. Go this way. Okay. So so it's the opposite, and uh, uh, as a result, uh, what will happen? is uh, this is already very high and not much change occurs there, but the minority carrier sees a big change. So the minority carrier sees a huge change. And, and, and so you have a lot of electrons here, and the carrier distribution of electrons is kind of going to go something like that and merge with that. So what happens is the minority carrier density at a little region near this junction edge is going to be really increased by a huge amount. It's going to be jacked up because of injection from the other side. And you're going to be able, able to inject a large density of minority carriers. And the reason I'm sketching it this way is, should be also hopefully here, that if you're shooting electrons through a p-type region, there are a lot of empty states sitting in the valence band, which are holes, and it will recombine with them at some point, right? So it's, it's going to, uh, uh, is that clear? If I were to shoot electrons here, if I put too many electrons here, there are a lot of holes already, and then they are going to recombine and either emit light or heat or something like that. Since it's a, electron is not a steady state, uh, you know, it's, it cannot survive in a p-type semiconductor. It's going to decay because empty states are available here. This is occupied. And this is a lower energy state. It's going to just decay. Right? And then similarly, when you're injecting holes onto the end side, uh, and there are so many electrons already sitting here, you can see they're going to just fill it. Right? And then they're going to dissipate the energy. And the energy dissipation can occur either by light emission, which is radiative, or it can occur through heat, uh, through phonon you know, vibrations. So there are two processes. But regardless of what happens, the carrier density is going to decay like that. And uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the most important, uh, one of the very important relations for any diode is N on the P side depletion edge. Xp, Xn, right? uh, sorry, Xp and Xn. So the electron density, minority carrier density on the P side at the depletion region edge times P on the depletion side. Okay. Remember N times P here should be equal to Ni square ordinarily, right? <coughs> but not under non-equilibrium. Under non-equilibrium, it's not equal to Ni squared. Np is equal to Ni squared is a statement of equilibrium. And clearly, when you apply a large voltage and you have current flowing it, it is not in equilibrium anymore. Right? How much out of equilibrium is it in? That is measured by this idea of the quasi-Fermi levels, you know, Fn minus Fp by Kt. So this is how far out of equilibrium it goes. This is what we are labeling as the quasi-Fermi levels. You know? difference. Okay. So NP times, N times P is under all situations, N times P is equal to Ni squared times this, under all situations of, uh, in, you know, injection and so on. Uh, in fact, uh, there are some, um, it's still some sort of an approximation because you all, you know, in, under degeneracy conditions it can change and such things, but I'm not, uh, for, for, for our purposes right now this is a, uh, this is enough and then this is reasonably accurate. Okay. 
So uh, under equilibrium, this thing is zero, and you get n p is a nice square, right? And but uh, the moment you pull it out of equilibrium, uh, this is the relation, and uh, uh, this is basically this result is famously due to Will William Shockley. You know the uh, uh, the splitting of the quasi Fermi levels is equal to the voltage you apply externally. Appro it's an approximation. This is and that basically completely solves the problem for you. You know, if this becomes equal to Q times V, uh, does that make sense? I mean, this is shocking approximation for understanding the PN diode current. So what, what happens is, is then this thing here becomes NI on the P side square. I'm just up, going to apply this and write E to the power QV over KT. So that's that. And minority K concentration here under non-equilibrium situation, right? Uh, and equilibrium is this, non-equilibrium is that, right? times the majority carrier distribution here, which has not changed much, it's the same as before. The product is equal to e to the power qv by kt times ni squared at, the, at that point. At that point. So uh, one can make the approximation here that the whole density or the majority carrier density at this point is roughly <coughs> equal to the acceptor doping density. Again, this is a pretty good approximation. And you take it here, okay. so that you get the carrier density. You get the value of this point right away. And everything on the right side is known now, right? Does it make sense? It's under non-equilibrium condition. So it's basically, what you have done is you've injected a bunch of electrons, and you know the density here now, at this point. Right? And the whole of PN diode current is, if you know the electron density here, if you know the whole density here, you know, these two values, you can now write down the current completely. And then the way you write down that is uh, realize that these are minority carriers and they are decaying. You know, you're, you're, you know, it's, it's, you're, you're basically uh, 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 shooting minority carriers through a region and they're going to decay because they're recombining. And you have to solve a, you know, a continuity equation here. And the continuity equation always is. Uh, if you want to find the number of electrons in any volume, you know what, what does your continuity equation say? The rate of change of electrons in any volume is equal to whatever is coming in minus whatever is coming, going up. Right? I mean, that's continuity equation. What is coming in? If your electron current is Jn, the current density, then uh, you know, J, so the J, Jn over electron charge is, is the, uh, uh, the number of electrons. Right? Uh, 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 that are coming in, and, and, and uh, so, so Jn over Q is number of electrons times the velocity, yeah. times the velocity. Remember, we're looking at a rate, not, not the number, but the ra rate of the electron in increase. And uh, the uh, way to look at it is if you want a point, if you want to find out how much electrons are coming in to a point in space, uh, you take the divergence of the current. You know, this, this is, let's say, a current vector. Just take the divergence. Of, but divergence is going out. And you want coming in, so you put a minus sign here, and that's that's the stuff coming in, the rate at which electrons are coming into that volume. That makes sense. So this is incoming minus, uh, uh, so minus outgoing, uh, outgoing as in, so so that would be kind of the net uh, rate equation if if you you allowed. Uh, uh, you know, carriers to accumulate, but I think you know that uh, there's also recombina recombination. You're losing carriers, right? You're losing carriers here, and and, and so this is the uh, increase, and then you have recombination of electrons minus if you're generating electrons. You know, let's say that's the rate of recombination. So that's the general uh, continuity equation, okay. and uh, uh, this is what you solve to. Uh, uh, so the current. Uh, we, are, we make the approximation that in this region the field, electric field, is very small, and we already know current looks like Q n, you know, mu n times the electric field plus Q times diffusion constant times d n by d x. You know, we know all that stuff. We, we did that. This is just drift plus diffusion, right? And we so said the field is very small, so I'm going to just throw this out, take this, plot that in there, and you get only the diffusion component and get the dn over dt is equal to, uh, from here you will get a, you know, like a dn, d2n by dx squared, and minus, uh, let's say your recombination is occurring at a rate tau sub n, you know, meaning you have excess carriers over the equilibrium. Let's write it in a more better way. N, 
NP in the X minus NP0, which is the equilibrium distribution. So that's, that's really your uh, uh, continuity equation. Right? And you solve this. Uh, we are interested in steady state. On steady state, this is 0. Right? Steady state meaning everything has reached, uh, you applied a voltage and the currents have, uh, you're not looking at transients. You, know, you, you have let it settle down and you're looking at steady state. So that's zero. So you solve this directly, you get a nice result that the, essentially what you get is this, this you know, the shape of this. How is it decaying? And I think it's, it's going to decay exponentially. That's not a, you know, big mystery here. But what you get is the length of decay. That's the characteristic length. Okay? And you get a diffusion length from here, uh, NP. Uh, x uh, is mp0 is going to be uh, I'm going to just write down this result uh, e to the power minus x over l n uh, I think the, uh, you, you can probably see that you know there is one characteristic length here which is uh, you know the product of this two ln squared is equal to the diffusion constant times the lifetime of electrons in that region uh, due to recombination. This is, a, this is the recombination lifetime. And that's a diffusion length. Ln is square root of this. You can say it's a random work or a diffusive process. It goes as square root of the time. The length it can go goes as square root of the time in some sense. So it's a diffusive process. And uh, uh, so that's your expression for, uh, for the electron density here. So just to be clear, uh, you can write it as is equal to NP0 plus this whole thing. And when your voltage is 0, this whole thing goes away. Right? Makes sense? I mean, so, so you get just the equilibrium NP0. What is NP0? That's Ni on the P side square over Na. Make sense? And, and so essentially what has happened, and this is the key to any PN diode, and, uh, uh, and be it a homojunction or a heterojunction. So you know the shape of this now. And remember, the current is basically, uh, if you know the shape, the current due to those electrons at xn, for example, is q times diffusion constant times dn over dx. We take a derivative of that. Let's take a derivative with x. You'll, you know, 1 over ln will pop out to the front. Right? And everything else will stay the same. You do the same business exactly, turn it around, look at it on the p side. And the net current is really the electron in the hole. But remember, they have separate charges. And there's a little argument as to why you can add the currents across, because the Fermi levels stay constant. That was also because of Shockley. But the net current is this plus Jp at x. Sorry, this is xp, yeah. At xn, which is q times d of holes. But holes get a negative sign because uh, uh, pn of xp. Uh, yeah, I think I, I hope you understand what I'm doing. I'm adding the diffusion current here and the diffusion current there to get the net current across the diode. And that's that expression over there. That's the classic diode equation, you know, which looks like this. Uh, so I think you see where all this stuff came from. There is a diffusion constant over ln, and then the minority carrier concentration here okay, in the coefficient. Let me write that down again. Uh, any questions? Yeah. 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 OK, so uh, I'm, I'm skipping a few steps uh, here, clearly. But uh, uh, I'll <coughs> and this part, I've spent quite a bit of time also in that uh, little you know, video, uh, if you want to make sure that you are clear on that. But the total current now will be the current diffusion current of electrons at the p side depletion edge plus the diffusion current of holes on the x side depletion edge. And this quantity is diffusion constant over diffusion length times the minority carrier concentration. It's important. N on the P side. Plus, because of this, it's just change the P on the N side. And then you get your E to the power QV over KT minus 1. OK, so. Uh, and then you know, that, that, that's what you're referring to most of the time as uh, this whole quantity as your saturation current, if you might, uh, times e to the power qv by kt. So, yeah. 
Um, all the material parameters are sitting inside here. You know which semiconductor you choose, the band gap, the diffusion length, diffusion constant, mobility is all there are related. Band gap is here. Doping density is also here, and all that stuff is sitting inside there now, right? So, so that that's it. so. As an example, uh, what you can do now is, is 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 say that what if I had a very heavily uh, doped uh, one side of the di diode was heavily doped compared to the other, much heavier. So that's a one-sided diode. Let's say we look at a, a P plus N, meaning the P side is much heavier doping than the N side. I think uh, uh, you, know, uh, you can see then if the P side is much heavier, uh, then uh, the minority carrier, um, let, let, let me just write this out a little bit. NP and PN, I'm going to write it in a little more detail now. N on the P side, or the minority carrier electron density on the P type side, is equal to Ni on the P side squared divided by Na, doping density, except a doping on the P side. Similarly, this is equal to Ni on the N side whole square by the doping density of donors on the X side. Is that clear? So uh, now you can, see, you can actually see the contributions of electron current and the whole current. They're not the same. Right? You can see that now, that uh, the side you dope heavier, if you dope P side much heavier, uh, uh, then this term is very high compared to that term. Right? And most of these others, in a homojunction, all, most of these other terms are really not that different. They are not orders of magnitude different. They are different. This could be you know, 10, this could be 20, or 25, uh, uh, D, Ds and LNs. But these, the doping densities and the NIs, are exponentially dependent on, on, on you know, that you can change exponentially, not this one. This you can't generally change exponentially. Generally, I mean, so I mean, there are some cases where you can, but in most general, it's not really as easily controllable as these. In a homojunction, you cannot control the numerator either, because NI squared is equal to N, C, and V. Remember, I mean, uh, e to the power minus band gap over KT, right? Okay. So if I have silicon on both sides or gallium nitride on both sides, then Ni is the same on both sides. Because all these are just dependent on band gap and effective mass of the semiconductor, right? So as a result, these two quantities also are the same for homojunctions. So the only game you can play is you can change these two and control whether the electron current dominates or the whole current dominates. You know, which one dominates? Most useful device applications in electronics, for example, you don't want both of them to be the same. You want them to be quite different, actually. For if you want to make a device that has gain, typically, you want them to be very different. And gain is directly proportional to how different they are, the asymmetry of the two currents. If you make a transistor, a bipolar transistor, the gain of a bipolar transistor is basically one current divided by the other. That's the gain. So that, in the end, that is the gain of a transistor. So essentially, for every electron I inject, how many holes am I injecting? That's the gain of a transistor. And what you do in a, in a transistor is you kind of add another terminal to collect one type of carrier, and there you make a bipolar from that. So okay. But the difference is the gain, and the difference is really, you can see, uh, uh, so, so for example, if you had a P plus N diode, heavily doped uh, P side, but lightly doped N side, uh, so this is much larger. You can see then the electrons will dominate the whole business here, right? Uh, so, sorry, what I was saying. If you heavily dope P side, right? P plus means which doping is heavy? And A is very high, right? So this term will be very low, right? This whole term will be very low, and this term will dominate now. This term will dominate. And in fact, uh, yeah, the current, uh, you can see then, you can write it down, it's just... Uh, 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 is primarily carried uh, by holes. You know, P plus, so injecting a lot more holes uh, uh, into, the, uh, 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 into the end side, and therefore what's going on is, is you have all the coefficients of holes now, you know, diffusion constant of holes, and diffusion length of holes, so that you diffuse across, and then, uh, and then you get uh, uh, the um, yeah, Ni squared, but let's write, uh, I think uh, I'm gonna just Take it from the NC and V e to the power minus band gap over KT over you know that that's NI squared 
over n. So that, that would be your p plus n current, for example. Oh, and, and then so and, and then that times QV over KT minus one. This is just the coefficient I'm talking about. Just the coefficient. Does that make sense? I just substituted values here. Uh, but you see now uh, the reason uh, it looks like this is is uh, and you see it, this makes it very clear what are the parameters it depends on. The reason the P plus N diode. You, you see, it may be somewhat confusing. You said the uh, a PN diode is a minority carrier device. It still is a minority carrier device, but the heavier side dope, you know, uh, wherever you have uh, heavier doping, that sort of that carrier is going to dominate. Uh, uh, you know, it's basically a fight between two minority carriers now, right? And the minority carrier that dominates is the side uh, is is basically if it's P plus N, then the holes dominate, and if it's N plus P, the electrons dominate because of this reason. And uh, uh, and I think the p in, in pictures it should also be clear that uh, if you dope p side very heavily, then your n on the p side is very small, right? Because that goes as n i squared over n a, whereas the p on the n side, which is the minority carrier, is very high compared to the other one because then goes like that, and this thing is small, so it's very high. Does that make sense? So, so that's why it's dominating. It's really the coefficient that that kicks in here. Another extremely important point you see is that the stuff that sits in the front is exponentially dependent on the band gap. This is extremely important here. And this will be the band gap of the n side. This makes sense. I mean, ni on the n side. It's the band gap on the n side. This is, uh, and, uh, uh, and as a result, uh, you can now look at the current density and uh, let's say you choose semiconductors, you choose various semiconductors, you choose silicon, and you choose gallium nitride, you choose you know, uh, four or five of these, let's say, and you make PN diodes with all of them with exactly the same doping, with exactly the same doping profiles on both sides. And you now measure currents in all of them and say, well, I'm going to measure my J versus V, J versus V. Uh, so that's essentially what I'm saying is that's your J0 here, and, and J's current is going as J0 e to the power QV over KT minus 1, both in reverse bias and in forward bias. This is the expression. Right? In reverse bias, this thing basically vanishes. If you apply you know, minus 0.1 volt already, this is a very small number, so you're basically minus J0 is the current. Right? This thing just goes away in the reverse bias. So, so now you want to sketch the currents. Uh, uh, so essentially, uh, in a linear scale, it's obviously going to look a uh, very you know, small current, and then it's going to kind of turn on around uh, VBI, which is close to the band gap, right? Very close to the band gap. That's where it's going to turn on. And uh, uh, in, in, you know, in linear scale, generally, if it's a good diode, it won't show up. But then uh, typically, you know, if, you, if I were to kind of zoom in, there will be a constant J0 here, you know, and then it will kind of go through 0. And uh, under forward bias conditions, you can see it start from zero, and it will go as you know a linear term first at very small voltages. You can expand out the voltage, you get a linear term, and then it kind of goes out to exponential. Right? Uh, if if I were to zoom in, does that make sense? I'm not sketching the whole thing; you can sketch it. Uh, uh, this is not to scale because this is really much higher than this. But what I'm trying to say is this quantity here is equal to J naught. And this quantity depends exponentially on the band gap. Exponentially. Uh, so that's the leakage current. Uh, typically, in a, in, a, in a breakdown, I mean, if you're looking at high voltage devices, this is the current that you do not want. Okay. And, uh, and, and uh, you can see how effective a gap can be in, in reducing it. So this is very effective in reducing it. Uh, now, looking at the uh, different diodes with different band gaps, uh, you can now see that uh, if I were to choose uh, uh, you know, a larger gap material compared to a small gap material. Uh, first of all, the break the built-in voltage is going to be higher uh, for a larger gap material. Yeah. So it's going to turn on because the built-in voltage, if you remember, is kT natural log of n a you know, n d over n i on the n side and n i on the p side, which is typically for Homo junction is the same on both sides. And when you get n i square, you get it's basically you know, you get a term which is proportional to the band gap. It's band gap minus a little bit. Does that make sense? Band gap minus kind of this and this. You know. 
this little energy slices there. That's the built-in voltage because you can see that you know the band bending here is the band gap minus uh, uh, you know this and this. If you want to think of it this way, yeah. so it's a small dip determined by doping. Heavier is the doping, the smaller is that change, and the closer it is to the band gap of the semiconductor. Okay. And in, in addition, uh, the, the, uh, the the slopes in a linear scale it's hard to make uh, make a good plot, but the slopes can change as well. I mean, rather in a linear scale, the way it looks is can, can change quite a bit depending upon the band gap of the semiconductor. But the reason I'm also sketching this is not just showing the importance of the band gap, but what happens if you have a diode and you actually do a measurement in the lab and make diodes. Uh, if uh, many times when you're developing new materials, it never looks like that. Never looks like that. It looks very different. And what you may see uh, uh, are, are two situations which I'll just sketch out. I think, uh, yeah. Okay. So I'll just sketch that out first. I'll just point out, you know, something which is uh, very often uh, uh, the case when you are developing diodes with new new semiconductor materials. So uh, a diode. Uh, you know, for with this characteristics, the ideal characteristics, we can write down. Uh, uh, you know, this J naught times e to the power Q by kt. Uh, that 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 we can represent by the normal diode as a, as an ideal diode uh, in in that symbol. Uh, but what happens is because of all kinds of things. I mean, for example, uh, you can have very uh, resistive contacts that you make to the P region or the N region. Okay, so, so you can have these are external to the diode. So if your contact has a high resistance, so that's a series resistance, let's say, okay. uh, uh, then the characteristics will change quite a bit. Uh, because uh, you see, uh, uh, so the diode has a curve that would look you know, uh, something like that, right? That's your diode IV. Uh, but the resistor has a, I mean, this resistor has an IV that, uh, that's looking you know, something like that. Right? All resistors look like that. That's Ohm's law, right? And they're in series, so I think you know the resistance is add, right? And uh, how is the IV going to look? You know, so the current will be the the uh, uh, oh yeah. How how will the current look, for example? Uh, yeah. So so uh, yeah. So basically, uh, as you probably hopefully you can see, so the current will be the smallest, right? Not the highest, but the smallest, right? I mean, it's just from here when you're summing, it is very close to the so smallest. That's that's all I'm going to say. You can obviously calculate it exactly, uh, uh, but uh, the current is going to start increasing, but then it's going to kind of become like that. It's going to be limited by the resistor. Yeah. It's a series connection of two diodes. Yeah. Uh, sorry, series connection of a diode with a series resistor. With a resistor. Yeah. So that's how the current is going to look if you are. Uh, going to uh, uh, have uh, uh, the the diode uh, in series with the resistor. Often, what happens is because of defects and other things but at the junction, you know, you'll have some broken bonds or dislocations and other things like that that will shunt paths. So it will create defects and other things, uh, defect states inside the band gap, and the carriers can leak through that. It's a shunt. So that's a parallel connection. So you can have that too. Let's call it a parallel resistor. Okay. And remember, when you are measuring from external conditions, you apply a voltage and you are measuring a current uh, that's flowing through there. Right. So this is your full network in general. So if you have a parallel connection, on the other hand, of two resistors, I think you can tell me how uh, it'll look. Uh, right. Uh, let's say the resistor again is looking like that. The parallel connection, obviously, you know, uh, uh, the let, let's assume there's no series resistor for a second again. I mean, this is not there. The parallel, con parallel connector. Uh, uh, then, then I, I, I hope you can see it is going to be the maximum, not the minimum, but the maximum. This is shunt, right? So, so it's going to actually look like that, and then it's going to look follow through like a resistor, and then it will turn on like that. That's the parallel connection. Make sense? So, so hopefully you can, you know. Okay, so the parallel connection will be this wavy line here. So the series will be the low. And this is what happens most of the time when you're developing new materials. You'll be measuring this, and you make the material a little better, grow under better conditions, reduce defects. You'll get better, 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 and finally you approach the ideal. Okay. Uh, uh, and, and in general, unfortunately, what happens is both of them are there, right? Both of them are present. 
uh, and and uh, uh, so 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 in, in in that case you will kind of see that and you know there'll be very little rectification sometimes you know and 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 what, so it depends on where these two cross over right? you may not even see the diode at all right? you're measuring all the registers most of the time does that make sense i mean it depends on if this crosses over there you're measuring this you know pretty much you know you go like that and then uh, you know the the values depending upon the values uh, if if the resistor parallel or series are different then you have different slopes and other things like that you're not really measuring the diode okay so uh okay so yeah this is by the way described nicely also in in your uh, book so okay so any questions here uh, if not, let's go over the heterostructure part of the story because that's where things start getting uh, get very interesting. Uh, and uh, uh, what we're going to do is essentially uh, closely uh, uh, look at uh, the consequences of of, of having uh, different uh, different band gaps across the junction. That that's what we want to see now. So different band gaps across the junction. So we'll start first with a very simple uh, picture, and, and uh, uh, just so that we are clear, uh, the uh, uh, let me talk about a couple of things about heterostructures first, which uh, I've been bringing up this thing many times, and I think that's okay because uh, we can't. Uh, there are many aspects to the story. So we have all these choices of binary uh, semiconductors, uh, elemental semiconductors. You can form a heterostructure between <laughs> silicon and germanium. Uh, you can form it group four. It doesn't have to be three fives. It, it, you know, silicon carbide is a is a compound semiconductor, but it's from group four, right? Uh, and uh, uh, or, or any of these others. And uh, uh, what I want to start with uh, heterostructures, and we'll you know look at the the effect on the diode uh, very soon. But let's look at a few very interesting properties of diodes. Uh, sorry, of of uh, heterostructures. Uh, this is from your book as well. So one, uh, one of the interesting things is if you make an abrupt junction, so you can uh, change the band gap across this distance continuously or abruptly. Right? An abrupt junction uh, is when you're growing the material, uh, which we are going to dis discuss in detail uh, very soon. Uh, you go from, say, gallium arsenide, and at this point in your MBE or MOCVD system, you, st you stop your gallium supply and open your aluminum supply and you start growing aluminum. This is an abrupt jump. And under that situation, if I choose two materials, and we have these three di different possibilities of the band alignment, and we have talked about that you know, a couple of times. And uh, I think one cannot talk about it enough because this is the key to most heterostructure devices. But let's look at it uh, one more time. There are three sort of uh, uh, what I call a rule of thumb, uh, sort of rules for, for these uh, uh, alignments. Okay. So, uh, if the uh, I think uh, on the left side, uh, let's call it one. This is material one and material two, and E V of one. Uh, we, what we want to do now is develop a strategy to not just understand the p-n diode, but how do you draw a band diagram uh, under for a heterojunction? Because that's really not trivial. I mean, there are many aspects to it that, that uh, one has to answer right away uh, when, when you look at the problem and you realize. So, I, I, and there's this delta of EC, which is the conduction band offset, and delta of EV, which is the valence band offset. I think uh, yeah, we can call it A and B, because that's what the relation seems to say, but the figure seems to say one and two. That's fine. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, what's very interesting, uh, you know, you'd obviously l think that it would be easy to calculate uh, based on atomic, you know, structure and tight binding and other things like that, what are the band offsets, but actually it still today remains a challenge, calculating the band offset between two semiconductors from first principles, you know, solving Schrodinger at the, you know, most coarse grown, uh, coarse grain level, uh, sorry, the, the most uh, uh, accurate level, uh, with atomic functionals, uh, still band offsets are not easily, I mean, they're not uh, yet accurate. 
Uh, but experimentally, you can measure them pretty accurately because you can make a quantum well and see where are the energy offsets, how many bound states there are, you know, and that will tell you your delta EC, right? That 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 we know. Experimentally, there are many nice ways to measure it. You can measure it capacitance, you can do spectroscopy, and all, all this other things. Uh, internal photo emission and other things. But okay, so, so you get the valence band offsets and conduction band offset. Uh, what is clear is delta EC plus delta EV must be EG1 minus EG2. That's clear in this, in this picture, right? Uh, if you have the other ones, uh, I think you can s you also realize that once you know what sort of alignment it is, then delta EC. Uh, delta EV and the difference of band gaps are all related. Right? That you can write down. So let's look at what happens now uh, that uh, obviously I'm not restricted to two materials. I can have a third material which has maybe a, even a different alignment like that. You know EC of this, the third material, EV of third material. So there'll be a delta EC of, of the, you know material B with A, material B with C. Right. So you grow the, this heterostructure, you measure the delta EC, delta EV. Then you don't do any of this, you grow that heterostructure, you measure that and that. Right? The first rule of thumb is, is a, it's a, the rule of transitivity holds for band offsets. Right? Meaning if I know delta EC for this with this, and delta EV of this with this, and I know delta EC of this with that, and that, and that, then I can take this out and find out what's the delta EC of that and that. That's the rule of transitivity. Does that make sense? And that's what it's saying, that if I know the valence band offset between A plus B, a, a, the A-B heterostructure, you know, B-C heterostructure, and then C-A heterostructure, I should come back to zero again, I mean, if I keep, keep adding them. Does that make sense? That's the rule of transitivity, meaning to measure these band offsets, you don't have to do three separate experiments, but only two. Unfortunately, it's a rule of thumb, but at least it should make sense. I mean, if, this, this is a there's probably not much wiggle room left here. I think with some of these topological insulator materials and all, there is a little wiggle room left. But uh, but for normal heterostructures, this is this is a rule. Uh, the other two rules are are actually very interesting, and they are based on observations. Uh, so the first is called the common anion rule, and this is where we're starting to get deeper into the material science now. Anion. So anion is the group five element. If for example in a three five, it's the gaseous element in oxides and nitrides but in arsenic. Okay, so, so essentially, uh, sorry, where, where is the, uh, I had the periodic, oh yeah, there it is, yeah. So, uh, so for example, if I have a 3,5 semiconductor, gallium arsenide, gallium nitride, so that would be the, uh, the anion uh, arsenic or phosphorus and nitrogen. So here's a rule, uh, rule of thumb again, uh, that uh, uh, if two, across the heterojunction, uh, let's say you have A, B is your uh, a, B is your uh, chemical composition, uh, atoms A and atoms B, and this is your uh, anion, uh, sorry, this is your, uh, yeah, that's the anion slightly negatively charged, group 5, slightly positively charged cation, and you have C and D, but I'm saying common anion, so I'm going to have the two the same now, and this is my heterojunction now. Okay? So if they share the same group 5 element, then the rule, it's obviously, uh, uh, the way it's written, we see, uh, it's, it's just saying that the, if the, ana if the uh, uh, anion is shared, then the delta EC, the conduction band offset, will be larger than the valence band offset. That's what it's saying. And uh, I think it's a little hard to see here, but uh, uh, let's look at gallium nitride, for example. Okay, gallium nitride. So it's hard to see, but this is indium nitride, this is gallium nitride, this is aluminum nitride, this is conduction band edge, valence band edge. So you see uh, most of the band offset is taken up by the conduction band, not much by the valence band. So this is the common, uh, uh, this is the common anion rule. Now if you go over a little bit to this side, you say the story is not that clear because, you know, here you look at gallium arsenide, uh, indeed, gallium arsenide and indium arsenide, most of the band offset in conduction, a little bit in valence. But we go gallium arsenide to aluminum arsenide, things are not quite the same. It's changed a little bit. So there are you know, exceptions to the rule. But it's a general trend. You can see this works for most of them. And there's a very good reason for that. Uh, I think in your current assignment, you're doing this tight binding model. And if you look at the valence band, the top of the valence band in EK diagrams, uh, 
of semiconductors, these states uh, come from the uh, p orbitals of the anion, uh, of the uh, anion, the group five. And if they are the same, what it's really saying is if I choose two, which p orbital states will have the same energy, really, most of the change has to go to the conduction there. That, that's really what it means. This is dependent on how much of that orbital comes from where. Uh, that you are, I think I've asked you to also look at it a little carefully in this current assignment, the first problem. Yeah. Uh, now, common cation rule uh, uh, is, is, is if you share this one, right? And now you make uh, these two separate. So your metal atom, uh, be it gallium or aluminum, uh, is the same across two, two regions, but the group five is different. And now if you look at this, uh, uh, what it's saying is uh, when the cation is uh, common across the junction, the valence band energies, you know, the level of this energy is going to scale with the uh, electronegativity of the uh, uh, electronegativity of the group five element or the anion element. So uh, what does that mean? So what it really means is if I take gallium nitride, gallium phosphide, gallium arsenide, uh, the more electronegative is the group 5, the lower is the valence band. That's what it means. The valence band edge is going to be lower the more electronegative the atom is on the group 5 side. And I think you know that when you climb up in the periodic table, you get more and more electronegative. Nitrogen is the most electronegative group 5 element. It really wants all the electron to itself. Right? It has very, uh, and oxygen is even more. That's why most naturally occurring materials are oxides. And you have to work very hard to remove the oxide and make it into a nitride, you know, typically. This is why you know, sapphire and many of these crystals occur naturally in nature, but gallium nitride does not. So oxygen is even more electronegative than nitrogen. Uh, I think you know that nitrogen is much larger in atmosphere than oxygen, but in spite of that, oxygen wins in chemical bonding strengths because of this reason. So it's much more electronegative. OK, anyway, so, uh, uh, so, so as you climb up, the valence band edge is basically going to come down. Uh, and you can look at it. And this is actually very uh, reasonable. Uh, let's look at antimonides, OK? And let's look at indium based. So indium antimonide, valence band is here. Right? Uh, let's go up arsenide. Okay? So indium antimonide, so then we go to indium arsenide. So the valence band went from there to there. Then look at phosphide, it went there. You go nitride, it went there. So you see this very large change. It depends on the electronegativity. There's rules of thumb, and, and I think it's very helpful if you're designing heterostructures where you have a, uh, you know, uh, uh, so, so typically the heterostructures that have been worked on are combinations of these three, you know, phosphides, arsenides, and antimonides. But typically heterostructures where you have the common cation are rarer in use, use than the ones that have common anion, typically. I mean, not always. But so, so uh, for example, uh, if, you're, if you want this sort of a heterostructure, typically it is uh, um, so, so for example, gallium antimonide and indium arsenide form this sort of junction. That has, uh, um, you know, actually that, that has gallium antimonide and indium arsenide has no common element. You know, so that's a separate matter. But yeah, uh, so that's a broken gap heterojunction. You know, so. Uh, but uh, so that would be aluminum arsenide and gallium arsenide or things like that, aluminum nitride, gallium nitride. Uh, this is, uh, uh, I think you can kind of look up from here. Uh, there is, uh, uh, I think this gallium antimonide with indium arsenide is almost broken, right? So indium, anyway, so you can choose these. Uh, but these are the rules, okay? Uh, it helps you design the, design the devices. So which one should I choose? What material system should I invest in? And it's a big investment because you're, you know, if you buy an epitaxy system uh, you, and you decide what material you want to put in, uh, that material will stay there for a while, and, and that's sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if two materials have the common anions, and the valence is determined by the orbital of the anions, uh, why should there still be a valence band offset? It should be zero, right? Good question. So. Uh, <clears throat> When the anion is the same, then why is the valence band energy not changing? Uh, uh, why is the valence band energy changing? Why should there be a valence band offset in the first place, right? Yeah, but because 
uh, this is uh, not a mathematical statement what we are saying here, but it's just an observation based on quality, qualitative arguments. The reason uh, of that is also because uh, remember the splittings are, you know, you start from atomic states and you have anions, let's say, right, and cations, and uh, you know the splitting is that forms the gap for you uh, is also dependent on how strong is this chemical bond, you know, the B12 here. Right? So that also affects things, you know. And so it's, uh, but what it's saying is that has a less effect uh, than you know on the valence band states than on the conductor band states. That, that's all it's saying. The, it's the magnitude of this, because there's a little bit of. I, I think if I give you the impression that there's no change in it, that's incorrect. I mean, there's this orbital here has maybe 90 percent or 80 percent of uh, p orbital from the anion plus maybe 20 percent of the p orbital of the cation. That's what I mean. R order measure. And that, this you can calculate. You have done it for gallium arsenide, for example, in your assignment. When you find the eigenvalue at k is equal to zero or gamma point, and say that, well, give me that, you know, give me the eigenfunction for this state, you'll see, you'll see it will be composed of a, anion and cation p orbitals. And the coefficients, you can ask your MATLAB or Mathematica to give you those coefficients, and you'll see that. It's much more from the anion side. It's not 100 percent, but it's a lot. But yeah. Okay. So, uh, all right. Uh, the next topic. So again, these are just common rules, and good to know them. Yeah. So, what are these all relative to? Is it like the vacuum energy? Or yes, something? that's right. Yeah. So the the zero here is 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 vacuum, and the electron affinity is, yeah. So as you can see, uh, if you can measure the electron affinity of two semiconductors, the conduction band offset should be equal to the difference of electron affinities. Right? Looks like that should be correct, but actually that's not correct either. <laughs> so <laughs> that was the first uh, first uh, theory for band offsets by uh, Anderson, not Phil Anderson. Some, uh, it's called Anderson rule. Anyway, let me not get into that, those details because once you dope things and all that, things start looking different now. So this is this band offset picture is, you know, kind of you are lining the Fermi level for all, and you know, there's some detail of that. Uh, I'll have more to say about band offsets later uh, when we discuss uh, particular semiconductors. This is one of those things where you know I think you are going to. Uh, it's okay to generalize in the beginning, but once you are really doing the work on anything, you have to. Everything has its own differences. It's not yet a science in that sense. So yeah. So, uh, okay. So, uh, what we're going to look next is uh, uh, a simpler picture where it's not an abrupt junction because I want to develop the idea for the band, band diagram. Instead of an abrupt junction, we're going to look at compositionally graded junction where you go gradually from one layer to another. That is a little easier to do the bring out the most important features of this uh, of this structure. And this uh, idea now uh, is uh, the following. Let me first sketch this out. And I've, I've, I think I uh, discussed that in, in, in the videos as well. Uh, let's say I have uh, created or been able to you know, do the material science correctly, and I've been able to compositionally grade uh, uh, a semiconductor which has an energy band diagram in space that looks something like this. That's it. So, so, so it's valence band, chill states, conduction band, like that. OK, so now. Uh, uh, what, the way I've sketched it is very peculiar. Uh, the way I've sketched it is I have kept the conduction band flat, and I've let the valence band float and adjust accordingly. Uh, and the band gap is changing, right? E.g., on the left side is let's say A, and E.g. on the right side is B. And I've let it flow. Uh, uh, how can I do this, for example, experimentally? How can I keep the conduction band flat? Experimentally, what can I do to do this? Meaning, maybe the materials, yeah. So you have any idea how can I make it flat? Yeah. Uh, keep the same cation, but uh, just. Uh, oh yeah. So you are invoking the cation and rule. Um, that's a, that's a qualitative. Uh, you know, you could you could do that. Uh, but uh, let's say I, I have chosen uh, the uh, materials which have we are which violate that rule. Let's say I've chosen a particular heterostructure which violates that rule. So, uh, so this is under equilibrium. We have not applied any. You know, I've grown the structure, and I'm saying 
this is what I want, how do I do this? And this is how the design problem comes in now. Okay. So, what is constant across this junction, what is constant across this junction? I mean, clear the conduction band, but at equilibrium, there's another thing that remains flat, right? And what is that? The Fermi level, right? So let's sketch that. So the Fermi level is, let's say, somewhere around here. And so uh, uh, I think you know that this quantity is EC minus EF, right? How do you control that experimentally? By doping. By doping. So I dope it with the right concentration such that this is, you know, KT natural log of whatever ND by, N, sorry, NC or ND here. I want to write it, yeah, okay. NC over ND. But you can see that uh, if your conduction band effective density of states is changing here, you need to dope accordingly you know, so that you keep this clamped at, the, at this level. But if you can do that, uh, let me put it this way. Typically, the NCs will change, but not too much in, in most heterostructures. They'll be kind of, you know, the change will be rather, rather small, and, and it's sitting in a log term, so you don't have to really bother too hard about them. So, so if you dope uniformly, uh, this is not an exact statement what I'm saying now, but if you dope constant across the junction, this is, you're, you're kind of sure that this will be like this. Uh, there might be slight bumps and all that, and this we do in a device physics course. If there's a bump like that, there may be a little bump like that here, but th that's more device physics course, not in this class. Okay. So with doping, I can fix it now. And uh, now it's very interesting, uh, because this structure has no analog in homojunctions. Uh, why? Because if I inject electrons into this region, you can see it has, it's seeing zero field. Right? So a negative charge, injected into this region is seeing zero field, but if you inject holes, which is a positive charge, it's going to go that way. It's going to see a field that's going to push it that way. Right? So there's a field for positive charges, but there's no field for negative charges in the same region. And this is something, as you know from electromagnetism and Gauss law and all that, is impossible in ordinary situations. It's impossible to get different forces on different charges, mag magnitude-wise. I mean, direction-wise, obviously, if you have a, uh, so that this is highlighted here. If you have an electron uh, and you apply a field across the whole junction, let's say, right, uh, e either it's flat in a homojunction or you apply an electric field and you make it like this. So if you have an electron, it has zero field and a hole also has zero field. If your electron has one megavolt per centimeter, hole also has one megavolt per centimeter. Always the same, right, in a homojunction. It's not true in a heterojunction. And this is the key because uh, this is, I mean, everything is related. The fact that you're getting this is because uh, you have, uh, you know, a, a changing band gap across there. So this, this is what's called, uh, so people have to discover or come up with a new name for this field because it cannot be, you know, explained from, from pr previous. So this is called a quasi-electric field. You know, I think, uh, as you know, engineers are very creative so, and not very fancy, but at least this is called a quasi-electric field. Uh, and uh, this field, uh, you can see there are no charges anywhere. You know, it's whole thing is charge neutral, but there's a field like this. So where did it come from? And it comes from basically the chemical composition, the atomic nature, right, of the materials. And the fact that you have microscopically what you have is atoms here, which are, which are the one of the energy states, but in real space, they are changing like that, right? So, so you have the p orbital states, and they're changing. And the holes always have a little higher energy, in spite of the fact that electrons don't. I mean, they are based on the alignment of the bands. That's where it comes from. And that should have been already clear if you looked at the homojunction, uh, sorry, of the heterojunction here, because now, you see, if I have an electron here, it wants to go there, because that's a lower energy. If I have a hole here, it wants to go there, too. Electrons and holes want to go the same place. You know? That's weird, right? That's, that's not ordinary. And that's, that's what happens in an abrupt junction. This is what happens in a compositionally graded junction. In an abrupt junction, uh, so as you can see that uh, if I take two uh, semiconductors, uh, and uh, let's say their band alignment is like this, you know, type one, and I want to build a barrier only for electrons, but not for holes. I want to break the symmetry. I want to build a structure where there's a barrier. Oh, sorry, let's say I want to build a barrier 
for holes but not for electrons or something like that, you can now do that now. You know, choose, choose the right, right structure. Choose the right structure and you'll get the right uh, arrangement of these atoms. Okay? So, so this is really a big change and this was realized in the you know, 60s and late 50s. Uh, and the result of this is, you know, the guys who made use of it were the Ward and Nobel Prize in Physics. Uh, because uh, you are really doing things that at least before that were thought to be impossible and then you can actually do this and this is done regularly uh, these have enabled uh, you know a lot of the high speed transistors and uh, high uh, and the lasers and all that this is what has enabled most of this so this is kind of I want to emphasize it many times so this is a very important point <coughs> it's a simple point now it's very important that uh, uh, you know you get a quasi electric field uh, because as I, I think you hear from here you can see your quasi electric field will be the net delta EV from here to here divided by the distance that you have here is your quasi-electric field here, right? And does that make sense? The energy difference divided by the distance is the field, or the voltage by distance is field, if it's linear. And uh, uh, this field, uh, uh, in the end, it has obviously come from charges and all that, but, but there's no unbalanced charge anywhere. So that's the weird part. If you have no unbalanced charge, Gauss law tells you your, you know, Gauss law tells you that uh, uh, minus charge over epsilon, right? That's Gauss law, right? No, no unbalanced charge uh, will... Uh, uh, well, okay, so I think you can kind of get a, if you have no charge, you can uh, still get a constant field and all that. But again, this is not related to the charges here. Now, that's what I'm trying to say. It's not, this field is not related to charges. But if, if you're looking at a field from there, that will be the same for both electrons and holes. Okay, so uh, uh, I, I will actually post this article, which is a very nice review article, uh, and uh, one, a couple of very important points made in the article. Uh, uh, is uh, if in discussing a semiconductor problem you cannot draw an energy band diagram, uh, this shows that you don't know what you're talking about, and that's actually correct. You know, uh, it has been proven for the last uh, few decades. And if you can draw one but don't, then your audience doesn't know what you're talking about. It's even more correct. So, so you know, in, in conferences, now you say, oh, this guy seems to understand it, but I don't know what he's talking about. So, uh, okay. So we will just look at, end the class today by just looking at uh, how do you draw the band diagram for a heterostructure PN diode, because that's where we started. We'll look at the homojunction PN diode today. We'll look at the heterojunction PN diode today. And really, not, I mean, the rules are straightforward, and you just have to kind of make sure that you, uh, uh, you know, follow, follow the rules. Okay. Uh, but we'll see that uh, the mo when you end up you see that it has a much richer variety of stuff that can happen in the PN diode. Uh, and and uh, uh, that's, that's where we want to just finish this. <clears throat> okay. So uh, what we'll do then is uh, we'll just follow this, this example. Uh, I have a, uh, you know, I, I'll have an n-type semiconductor and with a Fermi level like there. And I have a p-type semiconductor, but it's a different band gap now. And uh, I think uh, the way it's sketched is a gallium arsenide. Gallium arsenide, okay. okay. I, I'll just choose my own, that's fine. So we'll just do it like that, okay. Uh, Fermi level of the p-side. And it's a heterostructure now, right? You can see it. Now you can see the way I've sketched it already, I've decided that the wide band gap region, you know, this is your EC on the uh, N side, EV on the N side. So now, you know, I, I want to kind of label them so that I'm clear. V, E, F, N side. Is that, I mean, so that's, that's it. But I've already made a choice because I could have had this N type and that P type. In a homo junction, that doesn't matter, right? Which side you call it, that either. doesn't matter. Heter junction, it depends now. I mean, you can have this as an NPSP. It will be a completely different device than your one and n. So you, already that choice has been made. But you can try to draw the band diagram otherwise, and you'll see it's a good exercise. Okay? And then you have your electron. You know, so it says that you have the vacuum level somewhere out here, and you have electron affinity 
of q chi of p and, uh, <laughs> I don't think that's a pizza. <laughs> I think we are going to have it today, though. But yeah. Uh, okay. So electron affinity difference, band gap difference. Q times e. Uh, sorry, e g of n and e g of q. So all these things are different now. Electron affinity is different. And, and now one can ask, what is the built-in voltage for this one? And draw the band diagram now. That's the question. Okay. So uh, 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 let me just write down first. You know, how will the uh, I don't think it's written here, but uh, the built-in voltage now. Uh, uh, in, w what we'll see is even the built-in voltage. The built-in voltage is a, has a very clear meaning in a PN diode. You know. It's the barrier height for electrons to go from one side to the other. Exactly the same as the barrier height for holes to go from one side to the other. Right? In a heterostructure, the built-in voltage has, doesn't have a clear meaning anymore because the electrons will see a different barrier height than the holes. But the physical meaning of a built-in voltage for a heterojunction is very clear. It's basically the difference of the work functions before you put them together. Does that make sense? That, that's it. This is basically your Fermi level before you make the heterojunction, you dope it at a certain level that determines where is your Fermi level in inside. And you know the semiconductor parameters go in there. If you dope the P side a certain level, that determines where is the Fermi level of P side. And uh, the material parameters go in with electron affinity and all that. So with respect to vacuum, the Fermi level here and this, uh, that's the difference. And that's really the meaning of Q times VBI of a heterojunction diode, which is exactly the same as for the homojunction diode. But the expression, obviously, you can now do the math here and write down, and it will look uh, similar to the uh, uh, heterojunction case uh, in A and D, but now you will have to be very careful about what you write on both sides. Okay? So in A, so you'll get a Ni on the P side and Ni on the N side here. And Ni's are not the same. Right? Intrinsic carrier density depends exponentially on the band gap. Here it's very high, here it's very low because it's decay exponential. So you have to keep that in mind. That's not all though, because you see the electron affinities are different too. Right? Electron affinities are different, all these other things are different. So essentially, you just have to go through that, and uh, I think you probably know how to do this. If, if you dope it with uh, ND, you know how to calculate this little energy, then go up, come down, come down, and the difference is QB. You just write it down from there. And what you'll see, it's going to look something like that, plus, uh, 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 what was that? Oh, yeah, very important quantity, EG on the P side. What did I write there? EG on the P side minus EG on the N side. Very important, but it will get a half here. And uh, I think there's one more term, which is a ratio. Uh, this term is the w weakest term, meaning it, it doesn't. I'm going to write it down. I think it's uh, N C and N on the B side. So these are the conduction band density of states and all that sort of thing. Okay. Maybe on the N side, and N C on the P side, and N V N side and N V on the P side. Something like that. Okay. It may be upside down. I'm just this is a weak term. These are very big terms. And I, I think, uh, so this is the full built-in voltage of the heterojunction diode. And uh, I, I think I, I, you realize that if I have a homojunction, this is zero, this is zero, this is zero, all of them are zero. If you have a homojunction and you get your ordinary built-in voltage. But in heterojunction, you can actually make the band gap term, you know, cancel this exactly. So you have all these design freedom now. So you can, by choosing them correctly, you choose that the band offset is something or the band gap difference is something and I kind of cancel my doping potential here completely. Right? I make it go the other way or something like that. Right? So remember in a homojunction if I have a P plus N diode, that current is completely dominated by P type carriers or holes, right? I can turn it around by playing the band gap game now and I can make a P plus N diode be completely controlled by electrons, not holes. I can make that. Right? happen in a, in a heterojunction, kind of uh, pretty powerful in that sense. So here, uh, once you put them together, uh, 
Uh, let me just sketch this one, and uh, I think we will end the class there for today. Okay. So once I put them together, the one thing that's always going to be the same at zero bias is the Fermi level is going to be constant again. So to draw the uh, uh, picture, to draw the energy band diagram, uh, what we're going to do is, is uh, uh, actually I'll go back to charge first, because charge is the most fundamental. Uh, you see in this situation, the Fermi level is high here, low here. In that case, electrons will move from here to there. So as a result, this thing will get uh, positively charged, right? this uh, wider band gap region, and this will get negatively charged. Uh, yeah. So as a result, uh, uh, and it, luckily, the way I've chosen, I've chosen a simple problem here. <laughs> the N side, uh, OK, so anyway, this. Uh, this is what's going to happen. In fact, if you have a broken gap junction, you can see that there will be all kinds of other situations where uh, you, you have to put electrons in a heavily anti region. But this is anti region. It's going to lose electrons. It's pretty easy. It's going to just deplete, right? And it's, it's going to give you a depletion region with positive charges here, right? I could have had this Fermi level here, you know, below that, and this is P type. In that case, I'm like, oh, the P type has to become negative and the yeah, you know, uh, so so P type has to lose electrons. So it, anyway, you can see that that can go in many many ways right now. Okay, so I'm just looking at this particular, and then if you have positive, so the, the thing that charge neutrality is very fundamental, and it it will always be charge neutral. So whatever charge, the N type loses, P type gains, and and the net charge in the P side is so there's a depletion on both sides. Same deal, N nothing fancy there. But now you found the depletion edges. You can go through the same story that we did for earlier. So this was a charge. Uh, now for the field, you've got to be a little careful because uh, the field uh, we had sketched for the homo junction, you know, you just integrate the charge. So, uh, so it is going positive now. So uh, the, this is how the field looks, right? You just integrate the charge. But here, you have to be a little careful because these two are different materials. So one can have a different dielectric constant, epsilon n epsilon p, their dielectric constants may be different. Could be. Good example, well, actually, silicon dioxide and silicon have very large dielectric mismatch, but there are materials that can have large dielectric mismatches. Most heterostructures we use, they're kind of close, but if you have a dielectric mismatch, uh, there's another, you know, one of the Gauss law uh, uh, continuity equation across materials that says it's not the electric field that's continuous across a junction. It is dielectric constant times the electric field that's constant. That's the displacement vector. That's what's constant across any junction, unless you have a charge sitting there at that interface. I mean, here we have no, no extra charges sitting there. And uh, next class on Tuesday, we're going to see what happens when you have gallium nitride, when you have a piezo of charge at that interface. And then that really enters this equation. So here you have epsilon n and field uh, max on the n side is equal to epsilon p times field uh, max on the side. So essentially all that happens is there's a little discontinuity at this point now. Okay, so so, it, will, so it, it may be something like that. And that, that, that difference of the two is the ratio of the dielectric constants on the two sides. These are two different materials in general. Uh, most of the heterostructures we use these days, uh, these are the same. I mean, the epsilon is not very different. I mean, it's maybe 11.1 .1 in the other, 11.3 in the other, something like that. This is reasonably close. Okay. But, but this is one of the main differences that can happen. And then, uh, you know, your, 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 your uh, band diagram is the key. And then the band diagram, uh, I'm going to sketch. Uh, first thing is draw the Fermi level, which is flat. Right? And far from the junction, uh, the material has not changed, so the EC minus EF is the same far from the junction. Okay? This is EC, EV, and here's my Fermi level. Far from the junction is like that. Far from the junction on the right side, this side is P type, but it's a smaller band gap. So EC, EV on the P side, P side, like that. Okay? Now, but what has happened inside is interesting. Okay? And this is kind of a very interesting uh, thing you have to go through back and forth. I'll go through it now, and I'll realize by the time I draw the band diagram that I have forgotten something here. I have to go back and fix it now. So, so it's the self-consistency one has to do that, and I'll realize that now. So uh, clearly, this region has become p-type, right? Uh, sorry, this is p-type, and, and it has lost, so there's some band bending as you hit the edge of the depletion, right? And, and this thing has essentially lost 
Oh, sorry, this thing has become uh, negative stress. It has lost holes. It's becoming more n-type, right? It's becoming more n-type. So it's going to become more n-type, and it may so happen, depends on doping and all that, it may so happen that it has become, uh, sorry, when I say n-type, it's, it's accumulating negative charges. Right? But negative charges can now come in two forms. One is this fixed ionized charge. Right? This is from acceptors. But now you have a band offset here between the two materials. So what can happen, and what does happen, is that electrons from here, dumped here, so much so that you ju don't just have negative ionized charge, but you form you know, a bunch of electrons. Basically, your Fermi level goes into the conduction band at this point. This can happen very easily, and it does happen very easily. So, so as a result, so your band diagram now can be like this. It depends on doping. I mean, it depends on various things. As it's not quite accurate. So if you start depleting from here, it's kind of, you know, the curvature, remember, is dependent on, we are integrating this constant, so it curves like that. But there's a band offset now. Right? That's the key. There's a band offset. Uh, therefore, it can go below that. And the, what you form here is a two-dimensional electron gas. Basically, electrons will clump in there, and you have a triangular quantum well for, 2D, 2D, for electrons now. So those electrons cannot move this way very easily because there's a huge barrier on the left side. And there's a barrier on the right side, too, which is close to the band gap of the other. So they kind of get confined. So clearly, this picture is wrong. Why? Because I have extra electrons here, so I must have a bunch more electrons here, like that. Okay? So you go back, and you fix this. And you feel you look a little different. And so this is the self-consistency one has to do a little bit. Okay? But you can say from right here whether you'll form an electron gas or not. Here it's shown. It's an electron gas is formed. And uh, yeah. The PN diode. What you see now is, is uh, you can have various situations by, by playing with the doping, you dope it very lightly, you can have a barrier that actually is, and then a large band offset, you can make it into you know, something like this. Uh, and now you see uh, very interestingly the electron barrier, uh, you can already see it looks so different from the whole barrier because there's also this little barrier here and all this stuff flaring up. So you have now very different kind of uh, uh, barrier heights for, for the two types of carriers now. Yeah. Uh, you can choose two materials that have the conduction band completely aligned, but all the offset is in the valence band. In that case, uh, meaning you start from a heterostructure that looks, you know, the band alignment is such that it looks, EC is aligned. Uh, it's possible to have such semiconductors, and then you can have a band diagram for a PN diode that will look, uh, you know, very ordinary for the conduction band, but uh, you know what I'm trying to say is, and then you have a sudden drop like that for the valence band, and uh, you know this side of this sort of asymmetric heterojunctions where this gap is way larger than that, right? But the conduction band, there's no bending there. Mm -hmm. You can have that; it's possible. Uh, as you can see, this this junction will basically not have any JP; it will be all JN for this device is the whole barrier is just way too high. And with electrons, does it make sense? I mean, you can do this. And this, this, this sort of design is what really enables some of the fastest uh, transistors today, you know, HBTs and that sort of thing. It really enables those things. Uh, you know, this large band offset uh, and the large asymmetry you can get gets you very high gain and that sort of thing in, in this sort of structures. Okay. So that's the basic crux of the idea of heterostructure. Right? You, it's the same game, you know, PN diodes and all that. All that you have to remember is, you know, the band offsets kick in and, and then things change quite a bit. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay, so uh, I actually have a couple of more things, but I, I'm out of time and let me just check. Uh, I don't know where. <laughs> there was supposed to be somebody bring over some pizza, but don't see it. Uh, what I wanted to do was look at its consequences on some of the you know, lasers and, and such things and move on to nitrides, but we'll do that on the, in the next class. Uh, okay. Uh, but if you get this basic idea, I think that, that, that that's an important uh, uh, part of the really important part of the course. That, yeah. So any questions on this? And I can discuss that now. Any clarification? So, uh, yeah, I, yeah th th this is kind of the key if you realize that you have now the freedom to 
to engineer uh, things differently for electrons and holes. Or negative and positive charges can be extreme, behave very differently. So, uh, so, so just uh, j just as a you know simple example. Oh, <laughs> hi. So you want to put it over there? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so what we'll see is, is uh, um, you know, um, one of the very nice uh, illustrations for this, uh, and maybe it's absolutely the last point here. But uh, uh, is is uh, we, we're going to look at uh, this this particular design uh, of a uh, what's called the bipolar transistor. You know, you have n, p, and n, right? And uh, uh, so what you do here is you kind of inject electrons, and this is called the emitter, base, and collector. And you collect electrons here by applying a very large voltage. Uh, and so the speed of the transistor is really determined a lot by how long does it take for electrons to, to diffuse through this base region. So what you're doing is you make the base very short, much shorter than depletion region, oh, sorry, the diffusion length. And then electrons, you know, inject electrons, and they can actually make it to the other side before they are lost to recombination. And you kind of suck them out from th that side. And essentially, what you're getting out here is Jn. And what you get out you know, into the base is Jp. You know, and I'm not getting the details here. And the ratio of Jn, or collector current, to the base current is gay, beta of a transistor. It's the ratio of the two. Okay? And, and so uh, what I'm really trying to say is the gain is related to Jn over Jp. And so you can actually change the game very much by what you can do is come back here and say, I'm going to reduce my JP, but not reduce my JN. So you get a very large band offset here. So you exponentially kill the JP, but let JN through. Does it make sense? So, so, so now the holes have like a very large increase in the barrier electrons don't. This is how it's called a double heterostructure HBT. Uh, uh, heterostructure by double heterostructure bipolar transistor. In fact, you also do that here. You actually do a grading to get get in a little more kick and feel. And the other other thing people do today is uh, inst if you depend on diffusion, diffusion is a slow process. I think you know that uh, if you have a crowd and you have to walk through that. But if the crowd is on a slope, it gets faster, right? So drift really helps to move things fast. And you can actually arrange that here. You can choose the the base to be instead of flat like that, but through which you can diffuse, you can make it you know, like that. So, so now you inject electrons, but now they also get a huge quasi-electric kick. So that speeds up the transistors by a huge amount as well. So all these games are played to improve the speed of these devices. Uh, this is uh, currently, this design is in uh, uh, silicon germanium HBTs, which uh, uh, I have made quite a bit of commercial success. Uh, they go up to 250, 300 gigahertz. But if you go to gallium arsenide antimonides, they are touching terahertz now. So it's a very high speed device. So you kind of, that's a nice design for, for bipolars using this heterostructure concept. Uh, and, and the major part which we'll discuss is really the lasers, which uh, where what you want to do is you inject electrons into a region, but you don't want them to escape. You want them to be stuck there. You inject holes from the other side. You want them to be stuck there, right? And you know the fact that you have these heterostructures really enable that. You know, double heterostructure enabled lasers, which have enabled you know, pretty much all of communication industry today, right? So, uh, you know, through optical fibers and basically, you know, these are very efficient lasers, very low threshold, and uh, uh, and then they're made of arsenides, phosphides, and all that stuff. That's right. Okay, so let's stop that. Stop here today, and uh, we'll uh, continue uh, in the next class. And I'll, I'll talk about uh, more details now of, of, you know, what happens if you have a charge at the interface, which happens in nitrides and other things. We'll talk about that in the next class. Okay, right? And if, if you have some pizza.